Okay, let's go into the Word today. If you're ready in the Word, say Word. All right, if you have your Bible, turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 29. 2 Chronicles chapter 29 is where we're going to be today. And uh, as I said, you know, we're, we're a new church, but one thing we love is the Bible. Um, if we haven't met, my wife and I, my name's Billy, by the way, hi. Uh, we, we love Jesus. You should just know straight up, you're in a church that loves Jesus. I'm going to talk about him like I love him. Uh, I, I don't need a lot of people in the room to preach like I love them. I just need him in the room. And so today we're going to look a little bit at some stuff from the Bible that kind of ties into where we're at in our lives today. And I believe it's going to help you. I believe it's going to lead you to something good this, this afternoon. It's afternoon now, huh? Man. Yeah, someone told me, they said, Pastor, once we get to summer, are we still going to have an 1130 service? I was like, let's just wait till the sun's out more than two Sundays in a row. All right. Everybody, you know, everyone will be like, I got to get out of here. I'm like, bro, it's 40 still. Chill. Okay. Second Chronicles chapter 29. When you're ready, say, I'm ready. Here reads the word of the Lord. It says, Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old. And so we're going to read about the divided kingdoms of Israel. We're about 700 years before Jesus. And there are 12 tribes. Everyone say 12. 12. Two of them go north. 10 of them stay south. And they're in tension with each other. Two kingdoms that have different values, trying to make one nation work. Uh, two worldviews, two perspectives. Um, the, the northern nations are pretty godly. The southern nations, not so much. And so there's some tension, and we're seeing a lot of up and down kind of through the kingdom. We pick it up with Hezekiah, verse 1. He was 25 when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abiha, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David had done. Verse 3, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors to the house of the Lord and he repaired them. So his dad would have been king before him and his dad would have shut up the church doors, okay? His dad was worshiping God and other idols. And so he was like, we can worship God in this temple, but then we can also have some other influences in this temple. And, and I just want to say up front, God doesn't share a room with anybody. It's either he has all of you or he has none because sometimes we try to add him in. So his dad was an idol worshiper and he shut up the church. So the first thing Hezekiah does is he opens the doors and he repairs them. Verse four, and then he brought in the priests and the Levites and he assembled them in the square on the east. And he said to them, hear me, Levites, consecrate yourselves, consecrate the house of the Lord. God of your fathers, watch this, and carry out the filth from the holy place. I want to title this message as we get into the word this morning, Clear the Clutter. Clear the Clutter. If you're looking for something to write down or something to take away with you today, I believe God wants to speak to us from this subject. It's time to clear the clutter. Let's pray. Lord, help us today in Jesus' name. Amen. No time for a long prayer. Turn to somebody next to you, say, clear that clutter, clear that clutter. Yes, you're in one of those churches. Second Chronicles 29, awesome passage of scripture, reminded me uh, of a big moment in my life as I was prepping this week. If you didn't know, I've been married now for eight years. Can somebody say amen to that? Every year you make it another year, you feel like you're an expert. You know what I mean? So I get to year four and I'm like, I know everything about marriage. You know, and then you get to year five, and you're like, I definitely don't know everything about marriage, you know. And then you have a kid, and then you're like, I don't even know anything about life. Uh, but I got married to my wife when I was uh, 25. It was the first woman that I had lived with, first time I shared my bed with a woman before. Uh, we had been in a premarital session where we were talking about getting married, and our pastors were asking us, you know, about, like, cleanliness. Like, okay, how do you feel about living together? How do you feel about sharing a space together? You know, because we tell people to get married but then we never actually give them like the real practical stuff on how to do it right. And so uh, they were talking to us about who's going to pay the bills and how are you guys going to communicate conflict. And then there was a moment where they asked me, what's the thing you're worried about most? And my wife said something like really deep, you know, that our love would continue and like all this kind of stuff. And then they said to me, they're like, what are you worried about the most? I was like, to be honest, I'm worried about sharing a bathroom with a female. Okay, this is the first time here. I'm a little concerned about that. And then I told him, we're actually going to move into a two-bedroom apartment just to make sure there's enough space for us before we move in. And so my wife and I were so excited. We got married. We get to our two-bedroom apartment in California. And, and I was so excited. And then the first day we move in, I start putting stuff in that other room. We had our bedroom, and then I put something in the second room. And she says, no, don't put anything in here. This is going to be a guest room. 
because I'm going to have people come stay with us all the time. I said, okay, great. And so we decided that this is going to be a guest bedroom. This is going to be where people stay. And so one day for, you know, we were getting together to celebrate our wedding and someone brought over this big picture of New York City. It was like half the size of this stage. And they were like, we just want to give this to you. So it didn't really fit on the wall in our living room. So I kind of put it in the guest bedroom. You know, I was like, ah, I'll just put it in the guest bedroom. And then someone at church one day was like, you know, I have this elliptical, you know, like I really think you guys could use it. And I said, okay, well, we'll take it. And so we put it in our living room. Didn't really look good in the living room. And so I said, okay, well, let's just put it in the guest bedroom. And then someone gave me a bike from youth group. They were like, you need a bike, pastor. I don't know why. That's how kids are. They just want to bless you. They're like, take my bike. You know, thanks for everything. So I took that bike and couldn't put it downstairs. And we didn't have a garage. It was an apartment complex. So I kind of just put it into the other guest bedroom. And then clothes went in there and extra shoes went in there. And then before you know it, it was filled. And then one day my wife's friend called. I said, hey, I'm coming in town. Can I stay with you? And she says, yes, we have a guest bedroom. She called me up. She said, hey, my friend is going to come and stay in our guest bedroom. And then all of a sudden it hit me. This was a space that was reserved for someone else. But I had filled it with all my own junk. It was a space that had been designated so that at any moment's notice, a friend could come into our environment and we would be able to host them. But because of comfortability and because I just kept kind of adding to it what was supposed to be reserved for someone else, I had filled with my own stuff. You know, I fear sometimes in American Christianity, we say we have a space for God and we say that he has a part of our lives. But when it comes time for him to actually want to do something, is there room for him? I'm preaching already this morning. Is there space for him to come in? A lot of times we say we want him. The question is, is there actually room for him in your life? We're reading a story about a man named Hezekiah who takes over for his dad. You should know uh, one thing about his dad. The Bible says it very simply, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. His dad had been influenced by other nations. His dad was trying to build something for himself, but he was getting a lot of help from all these other places. And eventually his dad loses the kingdom and Hezekiah becomes the king. Now, most of us would say we can't have a good future because of what our past was. And we would say, I don't know how to be a good king because my dad wasn't a good king. And most of us would say, because I lacked those influences of my past, I'm not even going to try in my present. But I want to tell you, Hezekiah shows us. It doesn't matter how bad your family is or where you're coming from. If you're willing to be used by God, he will use you. Too often we come to God and say, here's the best version of myself. Instead of presenting who we really are and asking him to change something in us. Hezekiah has a problem. He wants to lead the people in worship. He wants to get them focused on God again, but the doors to the temple are closed. If you ever wanted to know a sign that God is not important, just look at the doors of the temple in this moment being closed. For the temple to be boarded up and closed, it was telling the nation, we don't care about God enough, so we're just going to kind of put everything on hold while we try to fix it ourselves. There's a temptation in all of us to try to fix it yourself. There's a temptation in all of us to say, yes, God saved me, but now it's on me to make it work myself. And I want to tell you, that's bad teaching. Okay, if grace saved you, grace will sustain you. If you can meet Jesus and meet God, not through your works, then you best believe he will help you continue to work for him. I say it like this, we're not saved by works, but we are saved to work. And sometimes we forget that he's the one leading us and giving us the strength to work. Hezekiah uh, is an Old Testament figure, but in the New Testament, there's all kinds of this idea of us having some clutter in our lives. You know, the temple was supposed to be a place for God, but now it was just cluttered with all kinds of stuff. You ever move into a place before or you get into a new apartment and, 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 and it's like spotless and it feels so good to bring all your stuff in because it's ready for you. It's been cleaned down. It's perfect. You know, everything kind of, maybe it's not perfect, but everything looks good. It'll work. Okay, how much more when God shows up in the room is he looking for something that's been prepared for him? Not clutter and filth and just personalities and preferences. And, you know, we don't preach politics here at our church because we want God to come. We don't preach opinions here because we want God to come. We don't preach like, you know, he's better than you because he did. No, that's not the Bible. We need God's help to realign us and and renew us. So for Hezekiah, he has a challenge ahead. How am I going to get people back on fire for God when the place that they normally go to do it has been boarded up? 
uh, there's a quote by a man named Leonard Ravenhill, and he actually kind of gets it. This is probably 70 years ago, I think he has this quote, but I want you to read it. He says this about the early church. He says, the early church was married to poverty, prisons, and persecutions. Today, the church is married to prosperity, personality, and popularity. What Leonard Ravenhill was saying was there was a time in church history when we understood we were going to get persecuted and people were going to come against us, okay? There was a time that we would actually celebrate the fact that we don't look and sound like everybody else. But the contrast to that idea is today it's about personality and popularity, and it's all about kind of like prosperity and how does everything work for me. And then you have people that don't know how to deal with life because they've been taught that everything should just work for them. I've learned this the hard way. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian. People still die. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian. Sometimes pain still comes. What makes you a Christian is not the fact that God removes you from pain. What makes you a Christian is you have someone to hold on to in the middle of pain. That's the gospel story. That although we're out of alignment and things are off, he presents a way for us to get back to what really matters. Okay, we won't see revival and people know Jesus if the house is cluttered. Okay, we won't see people coming to a real breathing relationship with God if the church is cluttered with all this extra stuff. It's time to clear the clutter, get back to some of the basics, get ourselves realigned again with what really matters. We got to get going on some stuff. So I want to present to you this morning three things that Hezekiah does that I think we can do in our lives. Okay, because the temple in the Old Testament is a picture of a religious institution, but the temple in the New Testament is a picture of your heart. For Paul says, you are now temples of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we can get cluttered in our life to where it's like we've got God and then we've got work and then we've got family and then we've also got a hobby and then we've got another hobby and then we've also got some stuff to clean and we've got all this going on that we can forget about the main thing. God is not at the top of my list. He's in the center of my life. And when something's at the top, that means it has the temptation for something else to go above it. But if God is at the center, ah, that means everything in my life revolves around him. That means my family revolves around him. My job revolves around him. My money revolves around him. It's not that he's at the top and he's first. No, he's the center and everything is connected to him. So Hezekiah shows us what we got to do to get back to that, to being connected to the center. Number one, first thing that he says really shows us how to declutter in our own lives. Number one, we have to first open up the doors. When you're looking at the story, if you go back and read, it was verse three. There's three things he does. And the first thing, it says this, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, he repaired and opened up the door. He doesn't wait until a national holiday. He doesn't wait until he gathers a launch team. He doesn't wait until he's got some money in the bank. He says, the first thing I'm gonna do is open up the doors to God again. You know, you can't change a lot of the circumstances going on in your life, but you can change the condition of where your heart is. And sometimes we shut the doors of our heart because our circumstances aren't going good. Or we shut the doors to people and we say, I'm not going to trust you because I've been hurt before. To have any meaningful change, friends, we got to first start by opening up the heart, opening up ourselves to maybe God does want to do something new. Maybe just because I had a bad experience before, doesn't mean that he can't make it right. You have to be open, open, okay? This is our number one goal as a church when people walk through our doors on a Sunday is we want to get them doors open in those hearts. That's why we start with worship. That's why we have a drum kit. You know, someone says, uh, first service, I was talking to this lady after service. She says, I've never been in a church where there's a drum, like drums. I was like, yeah, well, we're glad you're in our church. You know what I mean? Like, and then she's like, I just never heard of that. I'm like, yeah, I just think that if we're going to spend an hour together, we ought to have some fun. Like, it ought to feel like something's happening. It, you know, the drums are meant to kind of soften the heart. It's like getting to bang away a little bit and kind of, so- that's why we sing. Before we open up the scriptures, we sing because we're trying to get the heart open to receive what's going to be said. Imagine if, you know, five, four, three, two, one, the clock hits zero, and then I just get up to preach. I'm like, hey, welcome to church. Open up your Bibles. People would be like, what? But since that atmosphere is set for us, we have a chance to open our hearts, okay? Hezekiah's dad actually closed his heart. His dad was in position before him, and you should know something about his dad. You can read about it in 2 Kings 16, and and, and I'll just, I'll update you on the story, okay, so you don't have to read it. It's called Job Security. I'll make sure you know it. 
we're good, okay? Um, his dad's name is Ahaz. I'm going to say Ahaz. Ahaz, uh, he's the king at the time. The Bible says there's a nation that comes against him. So he reaches out for help. He, he reaches out to the Assyrians. The Assyrians come help Ahaz. It's all good. They're there for him. One day, Ahaz goes to Assyria to thank him. And the Bible says while Ahaz is there, he sees his altar. And the king of Assyria has this pagan altar. The Bible says that Hezekiah's dad liked it so much that he had an exact replica made back in Jerusalem, okay? He is so influenced by someone else's culture, he's willing to lower the standards of his own worship just so that he could fit in with the other culture, okay? It's a very dangerous place when you start trying to copy things from out there and bring them into the church. The church was not supposed to look like the world. It can have influences, sure, but it should not be defined in the same way that the people around us are defined. The church is the only entity we accept our brokenness and we we embrace the fact that we're not perfect. We celebrate that our members aren't all the way put together. That's the church. We we need someone to put us together and that's why we come every week so that he'll put us together. But it starts by first recognizing we shouldn't try to look like everyone else. We shouldn't try to sound like everyone else. Ahaz eventually uh, has the priest back home make the altar and as they come into the temple, we'll pick it up 2 Kings 16 now, As they come back into the temple, here's what Ahaz does with the other altar. It says, in the bronze altar that was before the Lord, he removed from the front of the house. So Ahaz goes to Assyria, sees that altar, comes back to his own temple, this is for God, and he takes what's in the center of the room and moves it off to the side. And it continues, it says he removed it, and from the place between his altar and the house of the Lord, and he put it on the north side of his altar. So all that to say is they took from God, he was in the center of the room, they moved the altar to the other side, and they put this new one in the center. Okay, so if God's not the center of your life, something else will be. And if you don't put him there yourself, someone else will assume that position. Someone else will say, oh, there's no center for her. Okay, well, we'll make it appearance then. All she's going to care about is how she looks. Or there's no center for him, so we're just going to make it money. And as long as he has a good education, makes a lot of money, he'll be happy. And we create these false centers, not realizing that that's space that's reserved for God. Am I preaching to anyone this morning? That's, that's clutter that needs to get out so that we can realign ourselves with what matters. Hezekiah, the first thing he does is he opens the door. Second, second thing he does is he gathers the Levites. This fascinated me as I was studying this week because I was like, okay, he opens the doors and he doesn't just get in there and just start church. He doesn't come in and just say, okay, let's light this place on fire for God. You know, let's get some sacrifices. He goes and gets some people to do it with him. Okay, if you want to do something quick, you can do it alone and probably get by. If you want to do something that really matters and goes a far away, do it with some people. Get some people in your corner that you can gather through seasons of life. Now, we all got that one friend that just kind of spills all their details and always vents to us. You ever that one friend, you talk to them, and they're always telling you something's going on, always something going wrong, always something, always something, you know? I got nothing bad to say about those people. At least they're talking. Some of us in the room today, we haven't shared what we're feeling in a long time. We don't champion perfection here. We champion vulnerability. God's not looking for you to be perfect. He's looking for you to be available. Share maybe what's going on in your life. Let's pick it up. It says, verse 4, he brought in the priests and the Levites, and assembled them in the square. What you should know about the Levites are, they are one of 12 tribes, okay, and they're from the the tribe of Levi, that's why they're called the Levites. Um, And you should know this about the Levites, okay? When Moses took these 12 tribes through the wilderness, and he was leading these 12 tribes, one day God told him, I want you to give land to all these tribes except the Levites. And so the tribe of Dan, they get this, the tribe of Manasseh, they get this land. You know, the the tribe of Naphtali, they get this land. And God gives all these tribes lands, but the Levites, he doesn't give land to. I would have made a terrible Levite. If I was lined up and I'm ready to find out what we're getting, I'm like, we're the Levites, yo. This is our moment. God's going to hook us up. This is going to be great. Moses is going to tell us we get all this land. They finally get to the Levites and they say, you guys don't get anything. You guys are going to be the ones that work in the temple. I would, have made, I would have made a terrible leave. I would have been like, well, can I get some land? Can I get something tangible? What God calls Levites to is not land. He calls them to himself. I'm not going to give you what I gave them. You get me. 
You get direct access to me. You get to come before me on behalf of the people. In the New Testament, the Bible says that you and I are now like priests of the old, that we are the priesthood of God. Meaning Christians now do what priests did back then. We don't, you know, light sacrifices on fire, you know what I mean? Or cut, cut animals in two, unless you're hunting, my God. Someone asked me to go hunting. They were like, you want to go hunting? I was like, I would love to. They're like, you better be ready. I'm like, maybe I don't want to go now. You know what I mean? Simple as that. But like priests aren't expected to do what they did back then, but we do have to keep the fire burning. And we do have to present an offering to God every day. You know what our worship team does Thursday nights when they rehearse for Sundays? What you saw, what you get to engage in when we sing songs, that's an offering. That's not for you. That's not for us. That's for him. You know what I mean? That, that, that's, that someone recently told me, you know, I really like the church. I'm just, you know, I just don't like the worship. And I was like, well, it's good that the worship's not for you. You know what I mean? Like, none of your name is going to be on that screen. We get to do this for God. And so naturally, we have to keep that fire going. He says, gather the Levites. You should know this about the Levites. The Levites are worshipers by blood, not by occupation. So the Levites are put in this position to minister, not because of it's their job. It's because it's in their bloodline. It's who they are. As Christians under the new covenant, we are now bought by the blood of Jesus. We are all now connected in this spiritual family, and we now sit under a different bloodline, which means we're worshipers not because we go to gospel church. We're worshipers because we're connected to Jesus. We're connected to him. So the Levites were worshipers not by what they did, but by who they were. And, And here's the deal. Levites can easily be influenced just like everyone else. They shouldn't be, but they do. As Hezekiah's dad was out there in Assyria looking at that temple and he saw that altar, he sends a message back to Jerusalem. And he says, I want you to go tell the priest to start making an altar just like this other God's altar. And here's what the Bible says the priest did. 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 16. It says, and Uriah the priest did just as King Ahaz had ordered. This, this, is, this concerns me a little bit because, again, if I'm a priest in a New Testament sense and you're a priest, we're all royal priests now under Jesus. We are all going to be tempted just like this priest was to just listen to whatever the king says. The king says, hey, I know we worship one God, but we're going to involve like 15 gods this time. And Uriah doesn't say anything. He's not recorded fighting back. He's not recorded bringing up the Old Testament Torah. He's not recorded at least trying to pray through it. He just did what the king ordered him to do. May we be Christians that check with that king before we listen to any king down here. May we be people that say, yeah, I understand the culture I'm in, but I'm not going to bow to the values of this culture. It doesn't match the place I came from. I'm not going to get caught trying to appease and make people like me. I'm after that king, and I want him to be pleased with me. But that priest just bowed down. He opened up the doors, Hezekiah. Secondly, he came in and he gathered the Levites. Thirdly, as I close, this is the last thing he did. He cleaned out the filth. Cleaned out the filth. So so, so now now I get an idea of what's happening here. So I need to open up my heart, right, because sometimes I shut it for the wrong reasons. And then once it's opened, I need to let the right people in. Not everybody needs to have access to your heart. Some people should get your hand, and that's it. Have a good day. But the people that get access to your heart, they should be thought through, man. Like, like, you know, I remember just being a youth pastor for eight years and like, you know, kids would come into church like 13 years old, like holding hands, you know, and then like, man, well, welcome to church. And they're like, we love each other. Like, okay, you're 13. They're like, ah, we're in love, you know? And I'm like, great. And then like, you know, what happens? Breakup happens and only the girl keeps coming to youth. And she's like, I can't believe this happened. Oh, my gosh. And I remember one time I told this girl, she said, uh, she didn't say he broke my heart. She said, he dropped my heart. She goes, Pastor, he dropped my heart. And it was pretty profound. Because we should never place our hearts in the hands of people that are going to drop it. If anything, our hearts should be in the hands of God And then as a response to all these other people, we give that. But too often we give our lives to people that were never qualified to carry us. We give our concerns to people that don't possess the authority to teach anyways. 
Like they're trying to teach us about something that only God knows. He's the creator. So I go here before I go to the news about things. Or I go here before I go to like, you know, some of my friends are more philosophical, you know, undercover atheists is what I call some of my friends. They're philosophical. You all are atheists. Let's just talk, you know. But like I go here before I just go listen to like a philosophy thought. These words actually show us how to be cleansed. Remember, the temple needed to be opened and we need to get some ministers in here. But the last thing to do was to clean it. This is how you recruit for a cleaning crew at church. You know what I mean? We need people to help clean the, <laughs> clean the church. Like, but the, it's not just getting the church open. It's not just coming to church. It's not just doing the religious stuff. Now I got to believe that God's going to cleanse me of some things that have made me dirty. What's your clutter today? Maybe it's past mistakes, and every time you get ready to make a new one, you're cluttered in your thinking because you keep thinking about the past mistakes. We serve a God of clarity. The Bible says he's not the author of confusion. He is a God of clarity. So if it's not clear and it's cluttered, that's not God. If you're having a hard time processing something that is clear, that's the clutter that's messing you up. That's not God. We got to clear that clutter out. We got to find out what's of him and what's not of him. And anything that's not of him is getting an eviction notice today. You know, when I was, when I, when I lived in LA before I met Jesus, I had this one friend. I was living with a guy and uh, he, we were roommates and, you know, he had his room, I had my room. And then, then one of his friends stayed with us. You ever had that one friend that stays like two days and then you're like, oh, so good you're here. And then like a week goes by and you're like, man, so glad you're here, man. And then eventually it's like two weeks go by and you're like, how long are you staying? Because this space is reserved for something and now it's just like haphazardly filled with something else. Jesus said in Revelation, I stand at the door and I knock on the door of your heart. And when he opens up our hearts, he's got some cleaning to do. Hear me. We don't open up our hearts just to let good things in. We open up our hearts so that bad things can get out. We need fresh air, amen. But we also need to get some gunk and some things from our last season that have maybe held us back. Because 1 Corinthians 6 says this. It doesn't say that, you know, we go to the temple. 1 Corinthians 6 says, your bodies are now temples of the Holy Spirit. That what they did in Hezekiah's day, every day God is asking us to do in our heart. Keep the doors open. Keep trusting people. Stay open to the Holy Spirit. Gather some Levites. Like, get some worshipers in your life. Get somebody in your life that loves God more than you. So that when you're around them, you're inspired and you're hungry and you want to keep going. That's what the Levites are for. They're not there to be the ones that know it all. They're there to be the ones that inspire the people. Thirdly, clean that filth out. I think about baptism, which we're getting ready to do today for an individual here. And I think about baptism, that idea and that picture of when, when you go under the water, the biblical significance is your old life stays there and you're raised to life in newness. That the filth and the gunk and all the stuff of you trying to save yourself, when you get out of that water, you're raised to a new life. It's not something you can do. It's only something God can do. See, Ahaz, his name in Hebrew means to grasp, to seize. When Ahaz was trying to do it on his own, he was copying the Assyrians. He was copying them, and he's like, I'll just do it. I'll just grab it. You, you ever been there before? You're like, if you want it done, you might as well just do it yourself. You're like, I'm just going to do it. I'll just grab it. Okay, Hezekiah doesn't approach it with this same attitude. Hezekiah's name uh, doesn't mean to grasp or to seize. His name means Jehovah is my strength. And so Hezekiah knows that his identity is in God, not in his ability. Hezekiah is a son that cleansed the temple. But can I tell you, there was another son that came to cleanse more than the place we go to worship. There's another son that came to a world that was filthy, filled with clutter, filled with junk everywhere. One day, this same son would walk into a temple and he looked around and he saw people dealing money. It wasn't filth you could physically see. It was a soul kind of filth. The Bible says he flipped those tables. 
And he looked and he says, why have you turned my father's house into a den of thieves? See, Hezekiah was the son that cleansed the temple. Jesus, he's the son that came to cleanse the world. Today, you and I find hope knowing that he's called us and chosen us and invited us into this. A few verses later, verse 11 says this, Hezekiah gives some instructions and I'll, I'll use them to land the plane here. It says, my sons, do not be negligent. So now he's in the temple. Everyone's gathered around. They got the Levites there, the altars there. They've cleaned the filth out. It says, my son, do not now be negligent for the Lord has chosen you. This is, this is why like, people ask, like, how's your church growing so fast? And I'm like, God's calling people. Like, we don't grow our church because we have good marketing or a good logo or something. We grow it because God calls people. You know, people will leave gospel. We've had people leave this church. And, you know, it always hurts. It always feels weird. But it's not to the point where we lose our minds because never once were they our people to begin with. They belong to God. He chose you. He called you. That's why you can't shake it. You know? That's why you're getting baptized today. He chose you. You just can't run from it anymore. There's just something that's just like, I can't escape it. It says, the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence continues on it says this to minister to him to be his ministers and to make offerings for him four things and you might be in one of these four areas the first thing he says is I want you to stand in my presence so the Lord chose me to stand in his presence that's the primary goal get in his presence you mean he didn't chose me to like go on a campaign and be the only Christian running or he didn't choose me like to use it for my benefit no he chose you because he wants you he can't wait to be with you. My daughter, as I said, she's two, and uh, I have a little goddaughter that lives in town too, uh, her cousin, so they're, they're, she's four, and then Atlas is two. And so one day I was with them, and we were playing out back, and I was on the threshold of our back patio. Like, I was walking out of the door, and I opened the door, and I was like, all right, let's go. And the first cousin, like, ran out, and she just ran into the backyard. And then my daughter, like, took a step onto the patio and stopped. And then she, like, turned back and looked at me, and then she looked at her cousin, and then she like looked back at me and she looked at her cousin and then she ran back to me and gave me a hug. <sighs> Heart just melted right there. My other goddaughter, she was like running for the trampoline. You know what I mean? She's going for the trampoline and the slides. But this one, she looked right at me and says, no, 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 I gotta come back for you. So you don't know what it does to God's heart when you just choose his presence over any trampoline life has to offer. You don't know what it does to his heart when on a Sunday morning, I haven't been to church in a while, I'm not really a religious person. When you just show up, you don't know what it does to him just to see you. He's not going, where you been? He's saying, wow, you're choosing to spend your day here. So stand in his presence. Second, look what it says, minister to him. So you're gonna stand in his presence. You're not gonna do ministry for others. You're doing it to him. Minister to him. He's the guest. He's the main attraction. He is the guest of honor. I'm so glad when people come to church. I hope you come back. We'd love to host you anytime. Come back. Only one person needs to come back. That's him. We need him to show up so that we can minister to him. Then after we minister to him, the third thing is we be his ministers. So this is a basic principle. You become what you do the most. If you're good at ministering to him, you'll have no problem being a minister for him. We are what we eat. You know what I'm saying? Like whatever you're focused on the most, naturally you become that thing. And so minister to him, be his minister. And then lastly, make an offering for him. And that's where friends, I can give you a sermon and I can give you a great outline and a guidelines and we can put kids program on and we can do all this stuff. But what you need more than all this is the presence of God himself to make something of that offering. You know, where there's an offering, there will always be fire. Most people say, I don't really feel it anymore. I'm not feeling the fire anymore. I'm just not loving it. Church is boring. That's how I know. The problem is not with the fire. The problem is you stop bringing an offering. I want the fire of God in my life. Okay, where's your offering? Because where there's an offering, there will be fire. 